Live from the Union Chapel in London, Spontaneity Shop presents episode 300 of The Guilty Feminist, otherwise known as Campus Springtime. With me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Tom Allen, and an amazing lineup raising money for Say It Loud Club and Can Do Action. Hello, Union Chapel! Are you ready for Campus Christmas? That's how ready you are. You're so ready, it's three months late. And it's campus springtime! Then please welcome to the stage your host for this evening, Deborah Francis White! Hello, 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 hello! Am I sufficiently camp? Could I be any camper? You're wrong! You're about to see it, people! I can be much camper than this. This is a sequin on a sequin, and I'm a feminist, and, that's right, I believe that Spanx slash all shapewear are from the patriarchy. I don't believe in them. I don't believe in them. Why are we trying to force ourselves to look like we don't look and hiding something? I don't believe in them. I don't believe in them. But... I do with this dress, and I'll tell you why. Um, It's only because I notice if I don't wear any shaper under this dress, I spend the whole night holding my stomach in, and I think, fuck it, let the patriarchy do that for me. (laughs) I'm a busy woman. I'm a busy woman. I've got comedy to do, I've got feminism to do, I've got activism to do, I can't be holding my own stomach in as well. And here's the thing, tonight... I piled all the costumery into a bag and I, uh, I jumped in the cab, got here and went, oh no, I've only got normal pants. So I am tonight like some kind of superhero. Yes, many superheroes do wear capes. I am holding my own stomach in. That's right. And I know some of you on the side are going... Your stomach's not in. That's as far as it goes. Okay, that's all the way in. And yes, it's still a bit out. But I'm a busy woman. I do not have time for the number of sit-ups or whatever the fuck I would have to do to get one of those. I'm not really interested in a concave stomach anyway, really, to be honest. I just did ayahuasca up a mountain. That's a revelation, isn't it? Some of you will not know what ayahuasca is. By the way, children, don't do drugs, stay in school. But... This is not drugs, it's medicine. Because drugs, it is, it is. Drugs make things more foggy. They make you think things are real that aren't. They give you confidence you don't really have. Then you kiss someone you really shouldn't. Next thing you know, one thing leads to another. Yada, 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 you're in jail. And you're, you, should, you're, you're, you should be in school. Um, but I did ayahuasca. And it's, it is, it's, it's medicine that makes things more clear. And I was talking to Ayahuasca about my relationship with my body. Well, if you don't know what it is, it's a Peruvian tea that you do with a shaman. And then you go into a sort of trance state and you start seeing things from your life. And it's really helped me. Do, you shouldn't do it just because I've said that, though. I worry that I say it and then you think it's a recommendation. It's not a recommendation. But if you get the call from this or Simon Amstel show, then obviously do it. But I can only recommend, I really genuinely I do mean this, and this is quite a serious bit, I can only recommend one place because there are all sorts of places and they might give you anything and you're not supervised properly and it could be awful. I can only recommend APL, Shamanic Journeys. I'm not in a cult. Um, I did go there for cult trauma healing and I now seem to be in another cult. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I was slipped into an accidental cult up a mountain. Anyway, I was gripping my thighs in this this I can't believe I'm telling you this this is not the plan I've had a very big week and I'm telling I'm revealing things I shouldn't be revealing it says I didn't really have a plan because I've had a very trauma I've had just like an emotional week and I'm just telling you stuff that I didn't plan to is this okay okay just don't tell anyone else um uh anyway I was gripping my thighs and mother ayahuasca who's the sort of maternal figure that appears to you said to me if you hate your thighs you hate me because I am the earth and you are made of me. And I was like, yes, that's very wise. And then I was holding my stomach and she said, a woman's belly must be larger than a man's or rounder than a man's. She said, rounder than a man's. 
because within it she contains the entire world. And I said, Mother Ayahuasca, are you being trans exclusionary? <laughs> I genuinely said that in a trance. I said, Mother Earth, Mother Earth, that sounds a just a ta- like must be, must be. And she said, it's a metaphor. She sounded so pissed off. I'm not making this up. She sounded so pissed off. And I thought, I'll test her. I wasn't asking of curiosity. I was like, mm, what is this? So I said, Mother Earth, are trans women women? And she said, yes, trans people are the most sacred people on earth because within them they contain both the tobacco and the ayahuasca, the masculine and the feminine. And I said, it sounds like you're avoiding the question, though. Are trans women women? And she said, yes, everyone knows who they are. And if you will just listen, they will tell you. And I really wish I'd asked about competitive sports now. Because I feel I could have come back with a lot of excellent answers. But the next day I said to the shaman, look, I know in you know, America there's the two spirits, the tradition, but in Peru, where this medicine comes from, and he's a very spiritual Peruvian man, and he, he doesn't speak English, so you have to speak through an interpreter, which makes him seem a lot more mystical. And I said to him, is there this tradition? I told him what Mother Earth had said, and I said, is, do you have this tradition in Peru? And he was normally so, like, kind and calm and sweet and charming. But he just looked a bit cross. And he said, Deborah, if Mother Earth has told you something is so, you do not check with a man to see if it is true. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but Mother Earth told me something, and I checked in with a man. I checked in with a man. That's the worst I'm a feminist butt in the history of I'm a feminist butts. And he was the one that said it to me. Can you imagine my horror? Anyway, I Googled it. There is. And that trans third gender shaman were the most sacred shaman of all in Peru until the conquistadors got there and brought Christianity and also understanding and learnt from them that, they, no, they killed them. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Union Chapel, but it's true. Christianity, I'm sure no one has been that like that here. I definitely have. Um, last Christmas, I, I just, just stop me. Um, I beg you to stop me. Okay, you do it. Last Christmas, it's not what happened. I got COVID. And so did everyone in this show. And the show had to be cancelled because it was not safe. And what we were doing, we were raising funds for two brilliant organizations. One is the Say It Loud Club. They are run for and by LGBTQ refugees. And we're going to be hearing from them tonight. These are people who are running from homophobic torture, in many cases, uh, capital punishment from death and from persecution. And sometimes they get to this country and the Home Office says, in these words, you don't look like a lesbian. I mean... Like Pretty Patel knows. <laughs> I've met Pretty Patel. She doesn't. She doesn't know. <laughs> I'm not full time. Don't worry. Don't clap. Um, <laughs> and also, we're raising money for Can Do Action, who this time last year were raising money to alarm Syrian schools against airstrikes. They have raised all the funds to do that between then and now. So now they have a new mission which they will be explaining to us tonight. Thank you for every single penny that you have already spent. There will be more opportunity to spend pennies tonight. Not that kind. Um, So thank you so much for coming. This is a Guilty Feminist event. We love you all. We see you all. We appreciate you all. We thank you so much for coming back out. We thank you that this is full. If there's a God, then she brought you here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, We've got some incredible acts tonight, but my first act that I want to introduce, I'm so thrilled that he said he would come and do this with us um, because he is honestly one of my favorite comedians, but also he's one of the most uh, famous and uh, bookable comedians in this country working today, and we have him. 
We had to fight off every channel on television to get him. We had to wrestle Channel 4 to the ground. We had to give the BBC2 a good kicking. But here he is tonight. Put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Tom Allen! Hi! Hi, everyone! Deb! Hi! Lovely to see you! Good, e good evening! Good evening! I didn't get a cape. I don't know why. Don't know why. I didn't get. Oh, we can get Not, you a cape. No, it's too late. Not all heroes wear them, and uh, I am neither a hero nor a cape wearer. So, Despicable Daisy up the back is uh, is is selling capes to the highest bidder for oh. our organisations tonight. So she how might clever they, they turned off the ones. heating, especially to try and up their sales. <laughs> it is freezing in here, isn't it? It is a bit cold. Um, Despicable Daisy, do you have? Uh, a cape that Tom Allen could wear. Oh, I, think, I, I think could model it if you like, I suppose. I don't know. Something, I, that go, something goes with my eyes. I think we would get more money for it if Tom Allen had sweated in it. Oh, yes. People pay a lot of money for that online. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone here is interested in a coat with the body heat and scent of Tom Allen... It's available. <laughs> it's very what? much... Oh, my oh. goodness, how quick. Oh, I feel like I'm being... I feel like I'm being coronated... Oh, how lovely. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Deb, would you do the honours? I would love to. That is to. a great one, isn't it? Oh, it's, oh. Quite, it's quite heavy. It's beautiful just so you know. Hold on, and perfect for wearing to Grandma's house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I could have held that. I could have held that, Deb. I, I feel like this is great. This is, this, this is a great piece of theatre. <laughs> We're all enjoying it. I'll, I'll fill, I'll fill. What do you, what do you want to say? I'm just, saying, I'm just saying I'm trying, I'm finding it hard to untie it, so busk, busk. Uh, oh, right, busk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, sure, okay. Um, <laughs> isn't it nice to be out and about? <laughs> uh, no, honestly, it is lovely to be at a live gig. I mean, I've done a lot of things on Zoom. And, I, oh, look at that. Oh, it's great for all your bullfighting needs. <laughs> um, I, oh, Deb. Thank you. Gosh, my, what big eyes you have. <laughs> oh, it's so fun, isn't it? Oh, I feel like a, like, like, a, like, like, like the devil has got a job at Scottish Widows. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, dear. Oh, I love it. Oh, I've never had, I've. I, for me to say this means something. I've never felt so camp. <laughs> wow, it's great, isn't it's it? It's camp as Christmas, right? Do you know what my favourite film... This is so niche, no one will get it. When I was growing up, my favourite film was a film called The Worst Witch. Yeah. Did anybody yeah. see it? Did anybody else see it? I was obsessed with it, and it had Tim Curry playing the Grand High Wizard. Did you see this? There was a TV series, it wasn't as good. There was a film, Growing Up Isn't Easy... Da, 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 da. And she was American, but the rest of the characters were English for no reason. Anyway, I feel like I've finally become like the worst witch. I mean, it was only a matter of time. There... <laughs> now I feel like I've, I've reached completion and I'm fully as camp as I'm ever going to get. Can I tell you my most wonderful story about why I wanted to uh, do this for Say It, Say it Loud? Because I want to tell it to you while you're in that cape. Oh no, what? Because you could <laughs> Is do it going to be a very profound story? And I'm going to be like, right, yes, yeah, no, it's so it's true, going to so be a, true. It's yeah. going to be a beautiful and profound story. And what I want... Yeah. And it's, yeah. going, it's going to be a beautiful and profound story and I want you to do a twirl every time it gets too profound <laughs> to break the tension. Gosh, imagine if at the, the end of it I'm twirling so much I throw up. <laughs> so terrible, so no, go on. Tell us a story. Okay, this story. is why I wanted to camp in Christmas. And okay. I, if I go like that, could you just do a twirl? Yeah, okay. sure. All right, let's just kick, kick it off. We kick it off. Yes. It was a Christmas just like this one, except not, not in March. And many of you will know that Tom Selinski, my husband, uh, produces the podcast, The Guilty Feminist. And many of you will know that uh, a Syrian man is very much family to us, and he lives with us. His name's Steve Ali. And, hold on, there's a photo being taken, one second. <laughs> Can you just, if you are going to take a photo, I might need a bit of extra push on the stomach holding in. I was Please. explaining to the people that I'd forgotten my Spanx, so... No, but they're the patriarchy. No, we've explained that we, we, we're too busy, we need to let the patriarchy hold our stomachs oh, in. Oh, the patriarchy is yeah. going to hold us in? Yeah. 
Okay, We've, fine, fine. <laughs> it, 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 you missed that routine. And I it was, heard a bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love I, he went I get the measure and he went outside for okay something right. about the patriarchy yeah got it Deb got okay. it okay <laughs> so <laughs> um, so we were going away for Christmas and Steve had had uh, one Christmas with us where we go up north to family and so this Christmas we thought oh we heard about refugees at home where you can have and many of you will be considering this now through Ukrainian re- refugees coming over and the scheme that allows Ukrainian refugees to come over, which we hope they extend to all refugees. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, we wait for the Home Office not to be racist. Um, and it's true. And uh, we, uh, so we, there's refugees at home. And one, one thing you can do at Christmas, if you're going away, mm. you can say, just have my flat. And then some oh. refugees can come and stay there and you meet and greet them and leave some nice things in the fridge and off you go. And they sent us this lovely man, and I said, I said, um, Steve, Steve, come in. I've just been sent a picture, and this refugee is such an extraordinary man. He's a lawyer, and uh, he's super handsome. He's actually a part-time model. And Steve went, let me have a look. <laughs> he went, probably doesn't speak English very well. And I said, well, according to this Steve, he has translated a book of Sylvia Plath poems from English to Kurdish. And Steve was like, what the fuck is this? Now, this man, who was called Uri, had had to run because of homophobic violence that was very, very severe. And he turned up. We sat and talked to him, and he was absolutely lovely. And we were going to a Grace Petrie concert. Does anyone know Grace Petrie? Of course you do. It's the guilty feminist. Everyone knows Grace Petrie. (laughs) So we went to this Grace Petrie concert and we walked in with Ari and there's all these queer people in Shepherd's Bush jumping up and down and there was this punk band on stage, punk lesbian band, and they were singing a song and the chorus went, I want to kiss you on the street where everyone can see. And Ari looked at me and he said, is this legal? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's, that's why you've come here. And he went, no, I knew it was legal to be gay, but this, is this legal for people to be like this? Like he was looking to the door like the police were going to come in. I said, well, look, Ari, they're still singing it in quite an angry way, so it's not entirely resolved. <laughs> they're a punk band. It's not, it's not a wistful love song. Um, but he said, but it's legal. And it was just this most beautiful moment. <laughs> like, like that beautiful yeah. moment <laughs> and then when we got home Steve who'd been like who's this guy said I've, uh, I've made a stocking for uh, uh, Uri because I want to pay it forward everyone made me a lovely stocking my first Christmas oh. and so I've made a stocking and I looked at it and said Steve that is a stocking for a cat <laughs> he went what I'm going to go that way he said, what? Why would they make stockings for cats? I said, I don't know. Some people do. He went, oh, my God. I had no idea. It's a stocking for a cat. And he said, I said, well, what have you put inside it? He said, I've put three things in. I've put a globe. That's because I want him to know that the world is his oyster. And he said, I've put in an oyster card <laughs> with 50 quid on it because I want him to know that his oyster is his London. And I've put in a little jar of Marmite because I want him to know the worst things about integration straight away. (laughs) And that was the most beautiful Christmas ever because that meant so much to Uri. It meant so much to him. And I've lost touch with him. He's changed his phone number probably for obvious reasons. (laughs) Not because of us. (laughs) Oh, my God. I think everybody made their own conclusion there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but that Christmas was the most extraordinary Christmas for me because Steve said I want to pay it forward I had never had a stocking before I came here and the first year three people made him stockings there were three Santas he thought it was a tradition like three wise men we were like no Steve Santa has just been very generous it won't be like this next year he said but I'm going to be twice as good I was like mm. <laughs> 
But what it made me understand by sitting and talking to Uri was how difficult it is to integrate. And so that was the instigation behind a show. I couldn't think of anyone better than the incredible Tom Allen because I couldn't think of anyone camper slash more Christmassy slash more of a wonderful human being in real life. And I, I love oysters as well. <laughs> I, I thought that was going to be one of the things in the stocking, by the way. I was like, and he put a disgusting oyster in it as well. <laughs> It was an oyster cart. Oyster. Anyway, the point is, he doesn't what? know. He doesn't write. He doesn't go on the tube. He doesn't know. He's a big star. He got here by limousine. Helicopter. He doesn't know what an oyster cart is anymore. No. <laughs> it's true, though. Lots of comedians seem lovely on television, but in real life, they're cunts. And Tom Allen is genuinely a very wonderful man. And I wanted someone... Don't, don't, you don't, I mean, please. He's only shown that side of himself to me so far, is what <laughs> I'm saying. And I don't want to know him any better, because I don't want to know the truth. The point is... <laughs> so thank you for coming out tonight. Thank Tom, you. Thank you for such you... nice words. Um, uh, what, what would, you... would you like to bring on our first act? Oh, my goodness. I am so delighted. There is such a wonderful array of people we're going to spend time with tonight. And um, we're, we've got some amazing comedians on the bill. Are you excited? And are you going to laugh a lot? Do them. Are you going to, are you going to show them loads of love when they walk out on stage? Deb, you have the best audiences. Well, I'm thrilled. Well, where did you go? Did you go and buy a cape? Did you buy one? So cold. Have you got any of those elaborate pantomime capes? I need to keep you warm. Uh, so, um, let's not waste any further time and let's start the clapping and the cheering. And welcome to the stage, the phenomenal Jen Brista! Oh, hi. Mm, isn't it lovely to be out of the house when we were inside for so long? Hmm? Wasn't it? Nice, nice, look at us out. Do you remember when we were scared of the virus? Not anymore. We're like, ah, fuck it. Spit in Nana's mouth. She's got to die at some point. Come on. Do you remember when we couldn't see each other? Except on Zoom. I remember looking at my mates on Zoom going, this, what is this? This is shit. How can we connect? I'll be like saying to my mate, I miss you, babe. I miss you. And I cannot wait till things open up, because when things open up, you and me, we're going out. I'm going to be living the Vida Local. Like my skin is the colour of loco. We are going to go out. We're going to hit the fucking town. We are drinking. We are dancing. Fun times ahead. Yeah? <laughs> yes, babe. Fun times. And then we put a date in the diary. We put a date. We put a, we put a fucking date in the diary. In the calendar, yeah? And we cemented it. <laughs> and then that day arrived. And oh my God, I hoped and I prayed that she would cancel because I'm... <laughs> knackered and I don't want to go out of the house. If anything, I miss Zoom gigs. I miss being in my kitchen. Yeah, saying to my girlfriend, just going to pop upstairs, do a little cheeky gig, open up the laptop, 15 minutes of dynamic stand-up, bam, I've made 11 quid. We'll never get that back. That's gone. We can't replace that. It's gone forever. I was, like, looking at my Instagram... You know how Instagram tells you, I think you like this, babe. I think you're going to like this. And then you see, like, Crocs with dolphins on it. You're like, you don't know me, Instagram. <laughs> I've been on Goop a lot, because I'm writing a show, and I'm obsessed with Gwyneth Paltrow. So I've been on Goop. I like to go on Goop, check it out. Check out what fucking batshit stuff Gwyneth's selling. <laughs> yeah? So Instagram went, oh, babe, I think I know what you want. A deodorant... For your vagina. <laughs> Hello? I'm pretty sure I don't need a deodorant for my vagina. In fact, I'm going to go as far as to say that I don't think there's a woman in the world that needs a deodorant for... <laughs> Spray on as well. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> what the... Not even a roll-on. I mean, that we could... 
We could lean into that, couldn't we? Yes, of course we could. Not a roll on. Can you imagine? Not a woman in the world that needs to deodorise their vagina. And if, as a woman, yeah, you're at home, you're alone, and you're like, you better get to a GP because you need antibiotics, all right? <laughs> There's not enough Febreze that's going to help that, all right? You go to your GP and you get some proper help, sweetheart, all right? <laughs> I like to go on Goop. I like to go on Goop. I love to hear what Gwyn's got to say. She's got a lot, a lot of things to say. Start of the lockdown, she, she went on uh, Instagram, put up a post and it stayed with me. It was something like this. She said, this is a time for nesting. This is a time for reading. This is a time to learn a new language. This is a time to pick up a musical instrument. <laughs> I thought, are you on glue, Gwyneth? I don't know what your home life is like, but I'll tell you what mine is. I'm trapped in the house with my twin five-year-old boys who I am having to homeschool. And I'll tell you what I've learned from homeschooling my children. I've learned this. These people do not respect me. Yeah? No. I seem to have all the authority of Matt Hancock at a SAGE meeting. So you'll forgive me if I don't have time to pick up a bit of cheeky mandarin or learn the piano forte. So why don't you take your vagina candle and shove it up your gluten-free chuff, love? Anyway, she's blocked me now. Um, <laughs> do hope you enjoy the rest of your evenings and do support uh, the charities that we are here for that I've <sighs> forgotten. Um, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, but we d I've run out of time. Okay, thanks very much, bye, bye. <laughs> Next, we have two incredible guests. Um, one is Dr. Rula Hallam from Can Do Action. And the other, well, some may know him as Judge Rod Rinder. Some may know him simply as Little Robbie Rinder. But he is back from uh, the border of Ukraine where he's been a journalist there uh, for some time doing extraordinary things. At The Guilty Feminist, we absolutely love a gear change as you know, if you know The Guilty Feminist, what's our best thing? A gear change, thank you, yes. I'd like that to be more call and response. What's our best thing? Gear. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage a warm and wonderful gear change. It's Robin Roller! So this is a real gift of uh, a discussion with Dr. Rilla Hallam and this being the guilty feminist. Um, halfway through our discussion about your extraordinary work, the light and the darkness that you're going to share with everybody, um, I'm going to mansplain it back to you and claim credit for it. <laughs> so just want to award that. Um, that would be ideal. Thank you. <laughs> it's a really interesting focus right now that the world's hearts, attentions and minds are placed into this moment of conflict in Ukraine. And as ever, where those dynamics take place, how quickly our hearts open and our minds and other parts of the world disappear. And the enduring and ongoing conflict in Syria is one of them. You're at the heart and the forefront of that, both as a humanitarian and as a doctor. And I wondered if you could just begin by telling us of the work that you initially did the incredible achievement, the change that you made whilst you were there, and the success that you had in making that change. Can I get my cape first? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I now feel welcome. Despicable Daisy, up the back, all the money goes to Can Do Action and Set Loud Club. <laughs> Woo. I'm so happy right now to front. <laughs> I'm happy too. Um, so, 
of course, I was there as a doctor and a humanitarian, but as a Syrian, first and foremost. My family were living in Syria at the time, and when peaceful protests started, calling for freedom and dignity, they were met with bullets and bombs. I was living in England at the time and started to do medical missions during my holidays and spent evenings and weekends helping to build hospitals. And 2012 and 2013 were the worst years for, for my family. Over 30 members of my family were killed. And during all of this time, I made a discovery. I realized that the reason that people survive in crisis is because of the remarkable work of the people in crisis themselves. It's the Syrians who are helping the Syrians. It's the Somalis who are helping the Somalis. It is now the Ukrainians who are helping themselves, of course, with global support. But it really is the local doctors, nurses, and aid workers who are from the heart of the affected community who dare to work and be where others can't or won't. Help us understand, sorry. And whilst international aid and those efforts are critical, and to say the very least, because we can't find language for so much of this, noble to be sure, um, it doesn't necessarily get all of the spotlight and especially a good deal of the funding. Can you give us an example of that? I'll give you from my personal experience. Um, back in 2013, I was on one of my medical missions and I witnessed a tragedy. A school full of children was bombed with a napalm-like bomb and dozens of severely burnt children came into one of the hospitals that I had helped to set up. And the most devastating thing for me that day was that I had the skill and the knowledge and the ability to administer potentially life-saving treatment to these children. I should have been able to give them oxygen and sedation and, and put a breathing tube and send them on a ventilator in a medically escorted ambulance to Turkey. And though I did my best and so did all of our very minimal medical staff, the truth is we ended up having to send them choking in the back of their parents' cars because I, the frontliner who could have saved their lives, didn't have access to the tools and the equipment and the resources that I needed. And this was happening across Syria and it's happening across the world. Um, the data shows that in the Syria context, for example, Syrians do 75% of the humanitarian work. So that's, I think, the first thing that most people don't know. We think it's the international organizations who, like you said, are doing good work, but they're not there in the eye of the storm, dodging bullets and bombs like the locals are. But for doing 75% of the work, they get 1% of the funding. And that was exactly why I founded Can Do. Now, I began this sort of throat clearing into this extraordinary courage, a word that you sit uncomfortably with but you bring us, bringing us in to this story. And part of the reason for that is because that sense that that monster has gone to sleep. A number of the reports that I've been part of making have been saying to people, this is 2022 in Ukraine, and colleagues of mine around the world texting me, writing to me from Yemen and from Syria to say this hasn't gone to sleep. Talk to us a little bit about this extraordinary project in schools that you managed to fund and why in 2020, 2021 and 22, it's still important now, why the war still goes on, why war crimes are still happening every day as we sit here in Syria. Well, unfortunately, the school bombing that I told you about was not a one-off. It was one of a thousand schools that was bombed in Syria and bombings that were still going on until last year. And so, sort of devastated by the feeling just impotent at just waiting for these children to arrive maimed and injured, um, we wanted to do something that might help to prevent that. And so at the heart of what everything that Can Do does is partnering up with the local responders. And so they told us that what they really wanted was to implement warning systems into the high-risk schools that give them a seven-minute warning before a potential aerial strike. And we had an overwhelming response from, from the community and from people around the world. And so we've now implemented that in 75 schools. 75 schools. How much did you raise? Yeah. Um, now, in the spirit of the light and that darkness, um, there are so many things that we forget to consider. 
like a pebble in a pond, the waves that affect human life outside of the initial impact sometimes don't necessarily get considered until a recent moment for you, which is where we're here now in terms of your most recent fundraising. Talk to us a little bit about that, if you would, this new project, um, which I have to say, um, as I sat next to you, I've been overwhelmed by. So, last year in March, exactly, exactly a year ago, it was the 10-year anniversary of the war in Syria, and um, I felt like I hit a wall at a million miles an hour, then got run over by a bus. Um, burnout, grief, trauma just caught up with me, and... Um, and I knew that I finally had to stop for a while and face the traumas and the tragedies that I had witnessed, of which I've only told you one. And as I started to tend to my own wounds, I started to talk with other frontline health and aid workers, both in the UK facing the pandemic as those in other war-affected places like Syria, and was awe-inspired as well as heartbroken by the enormous levels of burnout and trauma that are amongst the lifesavers. And it just suddenly struck me that, you know, can do's mission is saving children's lives on the front lines. And right now, it's the lives of the lifesavers themselves that are in danger. One colleague told me about her friend who walked off the intensive care and hung himself. One told me that she thinks she's going to leave medicine because she can't deal with the tragedy. Someone else told me that they have lost um, they lost 24-hour memory after they dealt with one of the chemical weapons. And so I realized that actually, if we are to save lives, we have to tend to those who are saving the lives. And so that's why we are founding our I Thrive program. Every penny that we raise today will go towards the lifesavers and a trauma and burnout recovery program bespoke to their needs. So it's the I Thrive program. Um, now... If you're going to save lives, you need to protect the lives, the full lives, all of the threads of their tapestry in order for them to go on to save it. And um, this I Thrive campaign, one of the things that you did was write to frontline workers, many who are working now um, in Ukraine, in Yemen, and on the ongoing war crime in Syria. You wrote... 11 points, and I read them just before coming out here today, I'd urge you all, every one of us, just to spend a little bit of time. It's a gift of two minutes, because whoever you are, they have validity for you. But I wondered whether you'd share one of the points that you wrote today. I'd be honest. Choose to see the light. There will be some dark days, very, very dark days. It's easy to see the horror and the worst of humanity in war, but you will also take a front row seat witnessing its very best. Every day and every moment will be a choice. Do we succumb to darkness or do we choose the light? No matter how dim, you are the beacons of light and the darkness of war. Others will look up to you to help them see in these dark times. So shine bright, my dears. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Deborah, for making this happen. Thank you so much. Dr. Rollo Hallam, everybody, and Rob Renda. Notice oh. anything? Oh, we had a costume change. We're like Cher. I've got yeah. cherries on mine. I, I want to advertise this, but also I don't, because I, I don't want anyone else to buy it. And I think the cloaks go to the highest bidder. So I don't think this one's very nice, do you? <laughs> I'd love it if you just bought all of them. Nobody got a look in. I turned up tonight, and I said, oh, I need to buy that. I want that one. And Daisy, who makes these, she's flown from Ireland for this. 
That's right. Really? Daisy is, yeah, Daisy's a full-time dentist and a part-time cloakmaker. Because life's like wow. that. Can you, can, you imagine, can you imagine the gowns people wear to go to their dental appointments? <laughs> oh, my God! I've never thought of that before. Yeah, can you imagine it? Imagine the surgical masks she must wear. Oh, Incredible. I agree, but she must, put, she must drape people in, in cloth. Do you oh. do that, Daisy? Despicable Daisy? Oh, happy sequin masks. Yeah, you made those. Sequin oh. mask, yeah, exactly. So, oh, um, yeah, I, lovely. When I, she came in tonight and I was pointing at ones I wanted, she looked at my husband and went, I'm afraid it's a rather circular economy. <laughs> <laughs> I like wearing the hood, actually, on my cape. I feel like it's... Um, I feel like I'm a... Did you do this at primary school where you just put it on your head and then ran around, <laughs> like, ran around with your coat? <laughs> Love doing that. Love that. If there are any casting directors in for Lord of the Rings, <laughs> which is being... I thought you were going to say, like, Marvel. <laughs> no, I'm just saying they are making it in New Zealand at the moment. Anybody in from Lord of the Rings, I'm just saying. I'm just saying I would love that. I would love to wear a cape in that <laughs> he film. Would, he would love it, and I think he'd be Lord very good. Have you done yeah. any acting? Oh, a bit here and there. I'm a bit hammy, to be honest. But I'd like to be in Lord of the Rings. Lord, of- if I did Lord of the Rings, people would think it was like a porn film, but like a silly one. <laughs> silly porn is a very specific genre, and I don't think what prestige television is it, going for at the they moment. I think I was doing something camp and silly. Well, no. I mean, you get what you pay for, don't you? <laughs> Pay your money and, and he your has waved his fee tonight, just to be clear. Mm, mm. Um, listen. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I, no, I, ha- I have done. Just to confirm, I have done that. Can you imagine? <laughs> Sorry, I was. Uh, to be honest, my mind wandered for a moment. Then I was like, oh, "I'm really hungry." <laughs> There's pizza There's out the back. There's some pizza out the back. No, but I'm trying to be off bread. Uh, oh, oh we'll, we'll, please! You should send your rider in. I'll, I'll deliver you something else. Yes, I did, and you didn't honour it. There's no puppies. There's no. No, okay, okay. I'm going to I'm going to order a delivery. Does anyone no. want to order a delivery for Tom Allen? No, please don't do that. Just so they've please done it. Do just that. so they no, can I'm say they've done it. Because this is in two truths and a lie. This I didn't is just come out here to guilt trip everybody into buying me a takeaway. <laughs> what would you like? What would you like? Ve- something, something, something from Harrods. Nothing too expensive. I think he's so down to earth. Something. When, do you know when I said before he's the nicest man in show business? Changed. It's a changed. F- <laughs> it's not really that. It's just it's a fucking low bar. Just. A- <laughs> he's, he's, I'm the nicest person. Can you is, imagine how bad the other people? He are? is, and he's going to make you order him a delivery. So you want like something like a poke bowl or a salad or something like that? A poke bowl, please. Don't say that. Don't call me that. Um, <laughs> that's my name on Grinder. The. Um, <laughs> the um, no, I'm, I'm, I, if I was hungry, I'd have the I'd have the pizza or the crisps. I thought you said you were off bread. No, well that's what I mean. If I was she, hungry, I'd eat it. She I really want? wants to get you something. Who does? There's a lady there. Two truths and a lie. She oh, wants Deb, to say I got to deliver. There's no one there. There's she's a ghost. She's waving. She's desperate. Oh, she there, adores sorry. you. This no. for her is a huge moment. I can't have any food off anyone. Okay, I can't. I, I can't. You, Thank you very look, much. Just though. so that you feel good about yourself, I order it and I'll make him eat it. Just Wouldn't that make form. everybody just feel great about themselves? To I'll watch make, me being I'll force-fed make, a burrito. I'll make, I won't make you eat it because consent's important, but I'll, I'll say, could you just have a nibble so that you've got the story I ordered delivery for Tom Allen? What's your I name? I mean, it's barely a story. Stacey. Okay, Stacey. it's Union I Chapel. I went to with a Stacey. Is it you? you Stacey, Stacey no. I'm more interested in your mum. Um, he's hot. No, I know, famously, the song... Um, it's a, that's a joke for a very niche audience of women my age. The young people, there was a song about Stacey's mom. Thank you, yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, niche audience that. of women our age. We felt it, we felt it. Um, I was very young when it came out, but I knew I'd grow into that song. Um, so just order Tom Allen whatever you think he would like. He's off bread. And then we'll share it. And then oh, I'll this take... is what this is actually about. Deborah just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely... <laughs> yeah, they don't do the roux. Imagine if they did; that'd be great, wouldn't it? Can you imagine? Just are these there any... mopeds going along, like down at the back, because those lacruzes are so heavy. Just get him an extra slice of anything. Oh. Hey. And Always... with that joke, I am sated. With all... um... it wasn't really a joke; it was more of a plug because I'm always working for you. No, oh, Deb, you're too kind. Too kind. Okay, uh, just before we say to Tom Allen, you're fired. No. Hey, Tom Allen, it's would one you of the bring other on? I present on if you didn't. Know. You <laughs> looked a bit blank there, if you don't mind my saying. 
Yes. Young people in thing. the front row who only watch TikTok, there's a thing called the television. It was a very early very forerunner very of TikTok. Important. You don't use you TikTok. Like what, what's, your, what's your vice? What do you use? Books. Oh, oh, this is the Guilty Feminist audience. Oh, books. Very good. Again, she benefits from a very low bar. <laughs> books. A, a teenager reads a book. Oh my God, a round of applause. <laughs> what was that? Oh, she's 21. This is all good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our next wow, act. Wow, what's amazing. Are you ready for some more comedy? Oh, then you will be delighted to know that our next act, you're gonna love her, but you've probably already fallen in love. It's Sophie Duca! Oh my God, hello. Hi, do you like my coat? Oh! <laughs> Thank you, I bought it instead of developing a personality. <laughs> it's so nice to see you, your faces looking at me in the Union Chapel, 31st of March, 2022-2. Nobody cares about COVID anymore. Nobody cares about COVID anymore. Nobody <laughs> cares about COVID anymore. Do you care about COVID? No, because you're not a fucking nerd. Excellent. <laughs> I don't care about COVID anymore. And I know this because two weeks ago, my girlfriend got COVID. That's the right level of sympathy. It's a very... Basic disease. <laughs> if you want to get something in 2022, get SARS, get Ebola, make it interesting. <laughs> Even nits would be better than COVID. <laughs> but she got COVID, and we all know that in the early days of this, in the early days of the panna cotta, if a loved one or a spouse got COVID, the natural thing to do would be simply leave them. <laughs> No bond of love is better than getting a cough for a bit. <laughs> you should leave them. But I reacted differently. I reacted differently when my girlfriend got COVID. Now in 2022, she was like, I've got COVID and I've been away for a while. And instead of saying what you should say, like, uh, it's not your fault. <laughs> I'll see you in 10 days. We can scissor over Zoom. Instead of saying any of that stuff, I said, could you not just lateral flow your vagina? <laughs> I know it's unbelievable. What is even more unbelievable is that she did it. <laughs> and it was negative. So she stayed in and I ate out. It was amazing. It was fantastic. I am, as you uh, probably know, have guessed by the coat uh, and my general demeanor. I don't necessarily think I scream queer all the time. I mean, like, this outfit particularly does. The shoes scream, I enjoy a tasty piece of puss. But I, in the rainbow spectrum of LGBTQ, I am both B, bisexual, and Q. Anyone know what Q stands for? Or? Yes, questioning. I am so questioning. Super, super questioning. Not because I'm questioning uh, my sexuality or my gender or who I'm attracted to. I'm questioning because every few months I just stop and ask myself, men, why? <laughs> I have not watched time with you tonight, but I have a bit of a PSA as a bisexual, as an experienced woman in all kinds of genitals. I have... I know this night is about a larger charity, but I want to say something to all of you before I go, and it is this. We have got to do something about dicks. This is very serious. I want you all to imagine a vulva 
maybe your own vulva, or if you don't have a vulva, maybe one close to you. <laughs> if you're not here with them, don't imagine the stranger next to you's vulva. That's <laughs> rude. Vulvas. You got it in our heads? The platonic vulva, archetypal vulva. Hold it in your head, not in your hands. The vulva. <laughs> Vulvas are next level. They are intricate. They are elastic. They smell like pad thai. You could imagine a row of vulvas on the deli counter at Waitrose. Whereas penises, dicks, are pleasant, but they look cheap. You can imagine walking into Iceland and getting 12 dicks for a fiver. A sherry bag of dicks for £2.50. I don't make the rules. And I don't want people to think, just before I go, I don't want people to think that that bit was anti-men. We're all grown-ups. We know that having a dick doesn't make you a man. You don't have to be a man to have a dick or be a dick to have a man. And for instance, I have a dick at home charging. It's not <laughs> about that. You've been lovely. I've been Sophie Chuka. Enjoy the rest of your night. Sophie Chuka, everybody! Everyone on the bill tonight is uh, LGBTQ+. Just give us a cheer for you in the audience, LGBTQ+. Uh, just give us a cheer if you are sadly straight. See how sad those cheers are. Those, they're more, it's more like disappointed moans. It's like, oh, this again. Same old, same old. I know, I know. This is, it's Stacy, I assume is straight because she wanted uh, to order Tom Allen food and she wanted to make herself more interesting. And is that true? No. You did, did you order food? No. You didn't order food? No, well, I said do. How come I'm not in charge of my own show? How come Tom Allen is now the boss of the guilty feminist? He's the boss of his dinner. My audience have been schooled in consent. Yeah. Did you actually secretly want dinner, though? No, he doesn't. Okay. Oh! Thank you. So Stacy, Stacy, you did the right thing, but so did you. Stacey, I love you for your, your consent. And are you up the back, what's your name? Dinny, Dinny? Dinny. Uh, okay, you don't need to give the surname out. Don't give your pin number. No addresses, no mother's maiden names. Okay, I have a very special guest. And what do we love most at The Guilty Feminist? Yes, absolutely. Now, you've seen him once tonight interviewing somebody else, but now we want to interview him. Put your hands together, make incredible girls famous woohooing noises for the incredible Rob Render! <laughs> now, Rob is so sacred to me, he's been allowed to wear the guilty feminist cloak. Turn around to give us a little spin. That's right. I would auction that off tonight, but I'm on tour, so no. Um, but I am going to enjoy sleeping in it now. Rob's worn it. Now, Rob... I feel like such a feminist. What was that? I feel like such a feminist. You feel like such a feminist? Yeah, you are, you are more feminist in the magical feminist cloak. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, why are you backing away from me, though? Every, every time I take a step towards you, you back away. It's my Auntie Lowell's in the front row. Auntie Lowell? Auntie oh, Lowell. Oh, that's Rob Rinder's Auntie Lowell. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so, two... <laughs> I felt they'd be more excited. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Rob, first of all, you've been to Ukraine recently. You've been recently. to the border and you've been reporting from there. Could you tell us, if you just had a minute with us, what do we need to know? What have you experienced and what would you like us to know? Because this is a very activated audience. Now, there's a lot of comedy audiences who'll be like, oh, we're not really here for this. But this audience, they care, they want to know and they want to do. But we are not just interested in awareness at The Guilty Feminist. We need to know, what do you know and what can we do? Uh, first of all, thank you, you know, as ever. So this is like a beautiful cloak because it's um, cloaking me in safety and uh, in humour and delight and you never forget the joy and the darkness. So with one minute, I want to say really what we were hearing before, that there's a lot of light in 
and on the border, just like there's light here. And yes, this is an activist, activated audience. In many respects, as we sit in a church, the best way of describing it is so often, and we've spoken about this, and perhaps we all think and are more mindful about this today, that we're often speaking to a choir that's already listening to our harmony. So if there's one thing we need to know is to hear the tiny thing I have to say and share it with those as difficult as these conversations are with perhaps those you perceive that aren't listening. Um, The situation um, on the border is perhaps as you see, but it's through the prism of telly. Less than one month ago, the women, and it's mainly women and children, the elderly and the disabled, um, were sitting in spaces like this in downtown Kiev and Lviv. They were computer programmers and baristas and on Ukrainian mum's net. And as they walk across that border with Dora the Explorer backpacks and square pants, sponge pops, whatever they're called, <laughs> the thing that you're more mindful of than anything is that sense of complacency that they felt about their sense of feeling like they were never going to confront a war. Less than a month on, they find themselves in Shemeshel Station or the border in Medica as a new word, as a reframed human being, as a refugee. And most of them, all the women we spoke to, want to go back urgently to fight for their country In one case, a woman said to me, and I'll never forget it, speaking to my incredible young uh, producer, they were talking to each other, and she said to this other woman in Russian, which I understood, can you just explain, I said, what you said to this person? She's 24, and I think six weeks ago was working in a Zara in downtown Kiev, and what she said was... um, I may have to leave because my town looks like it's surrounded and I want to go and fight. And you have to understand, she says, the Russians are prepared to fight, willing, willing to fight for our cities. We're prepared to die for them. That's 2022. And as they arrive on our borders, they want nothing but limited sanctuary and they want to come and delight in this one moment. Post-Brexit, pro so much political differences we have as a community and as a nation, there's been this moment of light where every community has answered the call to sanctuary from every part of our country to say, if I have space, I have a home. It represents the very best of who we are as a country. And yet, Deborah, there's not one British flag on that border. There's not one single piece of evidence of the promises that have been made by the British public from every part of our country. So are you saying the government doesn't have the presence that that reflects the will of... No, I'm going to say something much worse than that, Deborah. Um, Whatever your political complexion, I try to give people goodwill, those in government, some of whom I know. Politics may be show business for ugly people, but the reality is that (laughs) many of them, some of them you may have been aware of, may have gone into politics for noble purposes. But um, this is clear and unequivocal evidence of one of the most wicked and deliberate, cynical things I have ever seen in modern politics. There has been and continues to be a, a deliberate campaign, that's what it is, to ensure that the promises of the great British people of temporary sanctuary is kept at arm's length from people who need it most. The reason that we're not there, we're not present, is because Priti Patel's home office doesn't want us there and doesn't want us to be present, doesn't want your promises, the promises of those in Birmingham, as we heard before, and in Sedgefield and in Bolsover and in Islington to be met. It wants to ensure that it's as difficult as it possibly can be, that there are four forms, that a mum leaving war needs to provide evidence to the Home Office that she has permission from the father to remove her child from Ukraine and fill in a 50-page form. That's the reality on the ground. And the reason they're doing that is because there is a bill going through that many of you will be aware of. 
Yes, um, the Borders Bill. I suspect every human here, of whatever complexion, whatever background, that have come to be delighted tonight, we're in this church and in this chorus already. Hear, listen, be an act. Be an activist. Speak to those who you think may not be on side. There are, of course, the forgotten parts of the world. We heard about them earlier. Syria, for instance. Yemen, to be sure. And it's not the time yet to talk about why there is more focus on Ukraine, but there is. And it's a tragic gift. And it's an opportunity for us to explain to those who are otherwise cynical why this matters. Why we, at the best of humanity, have to extend our sanctuary. And if if we are a great British nation, as I really believe we can be at our best, we need to extend the promises of every community and make it fucking easier Mm -hmm. to ensure that those people who are crossing their borders, which are each and every one of us, but for one month ago, that those promises can be met. Write to your MPs, speak to everybody, speak mindfully on Twitter to those who would otherwise, maybe you would ignore. You have the power to speak. Your voices really do matter. And there are other things I'd like to do, but sadly, um, I'm not at the Oscars, and Pretty Patel... (laughs) It's not. (laughs) So... Rob, this is so fascinating. Would you come back on a full-length episode of The Guilty Feminist and really unpack this more? Would you like to hear more from Rob? (laughs) We need to write to MPs and we need to say, not only do they need to make it possible to do what they've said for Ukrainian refugees, but why is the scheme only for Ukrainian refugees? Where is it for Afghan refugees? Where is it for Syrian refugees? Where is it for Sudanese refugees? And we need to ask that question and keep asking that question and put pressure on them because they want to stay in power. Yeah. They're each and every one of us. They're each and every one of you. Um, they're all of us. Thank you so much. Rob Render, everybody. Thank you so much. Please keep that incredible applause going for a guilty feminist favourite. She's taking us out to the interval. It's the incredible Grace Petrie. Oh, they've got to set up for a minute. They've said they set up, and I can. Own, what has happened? I can only describe as a, well a very difficult situation. Now, what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm very excited. Tracy, because... are you hungry? No, it's Would Stacey. Like... Oh, Stacey, oh, Stacey, I mean. Stacey. Stacey was the very respectful, guilty feminist. Who I feel sorry. I feel Stacey. I've I've said the wrong things. Uh, in, in, in my ad-libbing moments. But Stacey, I love you as a guilty feminist and, and I love your consent. But also, and I wasn't quite sure what the name was. What was it? Denny. Was it? Dilly. Dilly, I also love you for your generosity. This is too generous. Dilly, it's, don't don't take it, it so seriously. It's only some Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was growing up, you only got like takeaways when it was your birthday. This well, is like a birthday. Like, not to be like, oh, poor me. But like, do you know what I mean? It feels like a special treat. Tom Allen, I'm going to say this is your honorary birthday. You have a sparkly cape and a chipotle. I mean, if it wasn't my birthday already, it would be. No, no it's not my birthday. Okay. But um, this is so kind. Thank you very much. This is much. a feminist birthday. What it means is you get all the treats, but you take a year off. <laughs> your age. Oh, I see. What? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you think I take the whole year Again, off? I was like, you, I don't know how to respond to that. I don't know how to respond. I was like, uh, okay, right, yeah, I agree, yeah. Sure, you, sure, you've yeah. got feminism to do. You ha- can't take a year off, and you've got homophobia to fight. However, oh, you're going to need the Chipotle got, to do it. You can't do that on an empty stomach. The reason you need to take a year off your age is that gives you an extra year of activism, not oh. because you care about looking young. Yeah. Are you ready, Grace? Are you ready? Sorry. Hey. Oh, I'm ready. A, Grace. Guys, sorry. No, you sorry. Do, no, you no, don't. You don't. No, you don't. Look, that's a rainbow cape. That's a rainbow cape. That's rainbow. Gays or nurses? It's look, look we gay nurses. Oh, no. so niche. It Trust is, you to be no, so niche. The, the rainbow has to be for LGBTQ community. Sorry, no one can steal it. Yeah, Obviously. those nurses. They've had it too good for too long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm we love sick the of it. NHS. Uh, well, it's not what you just said, Deb. Uh, what you just said. Uh... Give us a cheer if you're a nurse or 
more similar. Oh, they're too de- demoralized now. Listen to them. It's so, God, so sad. I know. I will buy you this cloak now. Oh, okay. no. Grace wants to anyway, fucking sing. Stop we crying. Can... Grace and Ben are going to do their thing now. Grace, okay. oh, Grace, 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 Ben Moss. Take up for last night, actually. Fuck you, Ben. Hello, Union Chapel. Are you having an amazing night? My name is Grace Petrie, and this is the wonderful Ben Moss. Good evening. And uh, I am a protest singer. That's true, I'm a protest singer. I've never had to follow such a, a diverse set of circumstances involving Chipotle and nurse bashing. I'm like, I don't know what side of the fence we're on here. Do you know what I mean? But, uh, but we're here for some very important causes and, uh, and I simply could not stand on this stage of all stages such a wonderful diverse queer bill without saying happy trans day of visibility my brothers and sisters and non-binary siblings right and you know often I do these shows with the Guilty Feminist and I'm not a comedian you know and I feel like I'm sort of coming out and, uh, and uh, coming out I mean <laughs> spoiler alert guys I'm gay uh, <laughs> I feel like I come out and, I, and my job is to sort of bring the mood down with these incredibly sort of serious songs. But I do think it is important, amongst all the frivolity, I think it's important to sort of give a moment to these amazing causes that we're talking about today and, and, and give a moment to the sort of need for queer solidarity here in the UK and all over the world. So I think, thank you very much, yeah, give it up for that. So I thought, me and Ben, I thought we'd come out and we'd sing something... <laughs> really fucking political and yeah. right on and then I thought no nah, these guys don't want that <laughs> so we're going to do the Backstreet Boys instead are you with us? <laughs> oh my god we're back again brothers, sisters everybody sing gonna bring the flame and show you how I got a question for you better answer now Don't have no fear Gonna tell the world Make you understand As long as there'll be music We'll be coming back again
have been listening to episode 300 of the guilty feminists with me dem francis white guest co-host tom allen and an array of very special guests raising money for say it loud club and can do action the recording engineer was grundy liz imbra the guilty feminist theme tune was composed by mark hodge produced by nick sheldon the producer was tom Zelinsky for the spontaneity shop thanks to gina dcio rachel craftman zayna muhammad callum baker ned sedgwick and every one of you in chapel as well as all of you for listening more information about this and other episodes visit guiltyfeminist.com time i've been told by the producer who's t- every time i go at the back he says we've we've spent two more minutes but we can absorb that if you hurry on and i know i don't uh so i'm so sorry to tom selinski and everyone else uh but i have a very special guest and what do we love most at the guilty feminist yes absolutely hello guilty feminist this is deborah well an incredible time was had by all at the Union Chapel, and that's only the first half of what was an amazing night of music, conversation and comedy. To donate to Can Do Action and help Rula and her team, go to candoaction.org and click support. Remember, awareness without action leads to depression. We can do action. And if you can't give, share, why not send it to the wealthiest person in your WhatsApp right now and explain to them what you've learned and why they should help. The Guilty Feminist is on the move. That's right, on the 9th of April, we're in Cambridge with Jess Foster Q, Jen Brister, Celia A.B., Grace Petrie. And on April the 10th, we're with exactly that same incredible lineup in Northampton. Then we're in Liverpool on the 22nd of April with Jess Foster Q, Sophie Duke, Celia A.B., and Jess Robinson. And the same lineup on the 23rd of April in Sheffield. More dates to come. Now I'm doing my stand-up show about coming out and going in from the 26th of April to the 7th of May at the Soho Theatre in London. Please come and see my new 75 minutes of stand-up comedy. I would love to have you there. It's a very, very personal story. Things that I'll not be putting on the podcast, so you've got to come out live to see it, and I hope to tour it soon to those who've been asking. Meanwhile, The Guilty Feminist is heading to Australia and New Zealand in July. We're going to have some incredible shows there, big theatres, fantastic guests, the co-hosts that you know and love. Get tickets now. Big Speeches is back online with Jessica Regan. That's right, you can go and take power and confidence with the Guilty Feminist Big Speeches workshop. Join our Patreon to get ad-free episodes, regular Zoom hangouts with me, and to help keep the podcast going. For more information about all of these things, go to guiltyfeminist.com. Now, Part two of our fabulous campus springtime Guilty Feminist Night should be already in your feed by the time you finish listening to this. See you there. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.